All right, Revelation chapter 6. Last week, in chapter 5, we talked about the different angels. We talked about uh, how the strong angel uh, proclaimed and came through and said, is there anyone worthy? And John bawled. I mean, the, 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 the words that... the, the that are used, the Greek word that is used that where it, uh, King James says that John wept. Uh, John literally bawled because he knew that there was no man worthy uh, to take the scroll. There was no man worthy uh, until the angel uh, told John not to worry, uh, but there is one. And we saw that Jesus, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, and then we saw him as a lamb that had been slain uh, the, both representing Jesus, both representing uh, how he is, uh, uh, how the world has affected him. Because before he came to the earth, he was just God. He was part of the Trinity. But when he was born of Mary, he became a part of humanity. He became a man. And by becoming a man, he was able to uh, be a part of all the pain, all the suffering, all the all the happiness, all the joy that we uh, feel and have in our lives. He was able to go through that and be a part of that and know how it feels and how how it feels to be tested and tried in tribulations. Um, and then he was slain. He was murdered. He was martyred. He was put to death. But he did it for us. So the only one that was worthy was Jesus himself. Now, in chapter 6, uh, let's see, in the latter part of chapter 5, let's see, uh, <clears throat> verse 12 there, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Uh, these, are the, these are the words that we as the church are going to be saying. That we, these are the recitations that we're going to be reciting to Jesus, but it's not going to be just worthy as the lamb that was slain. It's going to be coming from our heart. We're going to mean it. There's going to be meaning to it. It's going to uh, just be fulfilling as we as we say these and recite these words unto the Lord. Uh, and in verse 13, and every creature which is in heaven and on earth and under the earth and, and such as are in the sea and all that are in them <clears> heard <throat> I saying, blessing, honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. Do you all remember what I said about those four beasts? Remember the four beasts? <clears throat> it's, uh, beast is a bad word. I don't like the way King James Version here says beast. <coughs> Does anybody else have a different version? What's yours say? Living creature. Living creature. So that's what it should be. Because a man is not a beast. Okay, uh, 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 a lamb or, or, or a, an ox or an eagle, they are not beasts. They are living creatures. So I don't necessarily like that word. It's not a bad word. But when you think of beast, what do you think of? You know, a gnarling animal, uh, uh, something that's ready to fight and tear into uh, its prey is the way I feel. But the living creature, I think, is a better, uh, a better translation there. So... Uh, anyway, the four, uh, the four beasts or the four living, uh, living, what is it? Living what? Creatures. creatures. Thank you. Four living creatures said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Now, before we get any further, who are the four and twenty elders? You all remember? The church. The church. They represent the church. Okay? They represent the church. And the four living creatures. Uh, who do they represent? They represent Jesus. Okay, because he was the, the lamb. He was the, 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 uh, the led, led to slaughter. He was the eagle. He, uh, uh, meaning he, he reigns over. Remember, the eagle flies higher than any other bird in the air. So he reigns <laughs> over all. The, the ox, uh, which is the, let's see. Yeah, the ox is the servant. Um, it is the one domesticated animal uh, that you can set forward and let go of the reins and they will keep going. You don't have to, you know, kind of smack the reins uh, like you do uh, horses and such to keep them going and, and, and they will work as long as you feed them and take care of them. They will work and work hard for you. Same as Jesus, he came as a servant and then he was a perfect man. Um, 
And so they, they represent Jesus. All right, now, chapter 6. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. Now, as we're thinking about this, I want you to think about this as a scroll that is rolled up, all right? And, and it, as you roll it out, there's a seal there, and you have to break the seal, and you roll it out, and they read, and as a reading, uh, as Jesus reads this seal, or, I mean this, this scroll, uh, which is believed to be the uh, uh, <laughs> word popped right out of my head. It's not the birthright. It's the uh, uh, the deed to to the earth. It's the deed. It's the uh, uh, where God says this is yours because Jesus died for all mankind and redeemed the earth. Uh, all that believe in Him. He's the one that took it over. God created it. God created the earth. You all realize God created the earth and gave it to man and said for man to rule and reign over the earth and all the living creatures of the earth. But man sinned, and when man sinned, he gave up his right to rule and reign on the earth. And Satan took over. And the Bible makes it clear that Satan is the God of this world right now. But when Jesus takes this the scroll, it's a transaction. They're saying, you paid the price. You're the one that bought it back. This is yours. Now you do with it what you want. And to redeem the, uh, to the, uh, redeem the earth, their payment has to be paid. And do you, you all remember I talked about that last week with the, the, the one that goes into debt, that goes into slavery, to get out of debt, all this has to be paid. And they have the scroll written out and they have to go through each one and read it down. And I fulfilled, I fulfilled, I fulfilled. Well, all of this has to be fulfilled before the earth is fully redeemed unto Jesus, okay? For the price to be fully paid. Why do I say that? Because there are 70 weeks uh, uh, that, of Daniel that we read in Daniel, and uh, there's one week that has to be still fulfilled, and this is the last week. This is actually called uh, Jacob's, uh, Jacob's Tribulation or Jacob's Sorrow is this last week or this last seven years. Now, this is not about the earth. The earth did nothing wrong. The animals or the creatures of the earth other than mankind did nothing wrong. This is about Israel. They have to go through this last seven years of judgment uh, or punishment, if you will, because of their disregard to the, to, and obedient, disobedience to what God told them about the land that He had given them. If you remember, God said you can till the land six years, but on the seventh year, you can't do it. Well, they did that at first, and they were like, well, you know, the land's doing really good. Let's do it again. Let's do it again. And they disregarded these uh, the, the, the seventh year uh, 70 times. Or what was it? 10 times. 70. Anyway, they did it, for, for, and God punished them and said, okay, you're going to exit me exile for 70 years. And uh, see, they were actually out 69. They ever got one more year. All right. Did y'all come up with that illusion? Sorry. I went around like that real quick, so I hope I didn't lose. All right. Now, and I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come and see. Now, we're still in heaven, all right? Remember, uh, John going to heaven is a picture of the rapture, all right? A picture of the rapture of the church. We're in heaven. But the, the, the uh, elder... Or one of the four beasts says, come and see. And he wants John to see what's going on. He hears. Uh, J. Vernon McGee says this is like a, a TV show. It's kind of like a movie. As this is going, John is seeing this. He's, he's not being told this. He's seeing this. It's different from a radio show. It's like, uh, just like a TV show. He's watching and seeing these things happen. Okay, verse 2. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. All right, let's stop here for a second. Who do you all think is on this on the white horse? No. No. Why do I say no? Think about it. He's the lamb opening the scroll. Right. He's the one opening the scroll. So it's, it would be kind of weird if Jesus was opening the scroll and he was down there on the white horse. Okay? I thought he was the four beasts. What's that? The four beasts. No, no, no. The, the, the four beasts told John to come and see. Yeah, but I thought you said the four beasts was Jesus. They represent Jesus. Represent. Yeah, the four beasts represent Jesus. Yes. 
Sorry, I get to talk and I get excited and I talk really fast. And if I go too fast, guys, y'all just tell me to slow down, okay? Just tell me. I get, I get a little going here. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so, all right. Uh, it says there in verse 2, and I, and I saw and behold a white horse. What this is, who this is, is the Antichrist. The Antichrist comes as mimicking what Jesus said he's going, he will bring. Remember? Jesus said, with, with me I give you peace. Not peace as the world gives you, but peace that only I can give you. Okay? This is a false peace. Coming in a white horse. Okay? We read about the white horse later on, but that's when Jesus comes with the church. Okay? But that's later on. Right? right now we see we're just in the very beginning of the tribulation here. It says, and that he sat on him, uh, and he that sat on him had a bow, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, if I was to go down here to Hayden, and I say, hey, I want you to go out there, and I want you to kill that deer. Here's your bow. What else do you need? An arrow. An arrow. Yeah, bow and an arrow is what you had. Yeah, I, I just said bow, but it was a trick. I'm sorry. Uh, I didn't. You can tell totally shoot air. You can shoot air, but I don't think it'll kill anything. <laughs> right, but see, he's going around with just a bow. And, and what that is, is false peace. He's carrying the bow and he says, look, I come, I'm going to take over unless you start following me, unless you start becoming a part of our group. Hey, we're going to create a group here, all right? And because we've got more people than these guys, we're going to come along and we're going to have our knives, we're going to have our guns, we're going to have our bows, and we're going to have our swords, and we'll come up to y'all and say, hey, look, join us, or we're going to die, or you die. Okay? So what are you going to do? If we, say we had 50 people over here, and it was just y'all, what would you do? Probably join us. And you say, hey, look, join us, because look at how good we got it. We have peace, uh, but we don't want anybody against us. And that's what the Antichrist is coming around doing. He's saying that if, if you join us, then you're going to have peace. If you join us, be a part of our group, uh, you don't have to worry about war anymore. And he goes and it says, and, and he, uh, and a crown was given unto him. A crown meaning he became the ruler. He became the one leading. He became the one everyone was looking to. Uh, just like uh, uh, in the United States, when people, when other countries uh, think of the ruler of the United States, who do they think of? Yay. Trump. Right. They think of Trump. Uh, they they think of him as being the ruler, not that he wears a crown, but if he were to wear a crown, everybody would think of him as the ruler. Uh, when you think of the ruler of England, who do you think of? Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth, right? She actually is not the ruler. They are just royalty by name. Uh, it's parliament that actually rules, but th see what I'm saying? You think of because of the crown. Well, he's going to rule because he is given a crown. He is the leader. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. But he only has a bow. All right? he, he, he says, look, uh, follow me and we'll have peace. Peace beyond whatever we think. Whatever you can imagine. Uh, every president has said when, he, when he's trying to, uh, to be elected, I'm going to do everything I can for world peace. I'm going to bring peace to the Middle East. I'm going to do this. I mean, that way we can stay away from... Uh, 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 wars. We don't want to go to war. We want peace. We want peace. But every one of them, uh, we we have, have we had peace on any president, period? I don't think we've ever had peace under a, a president. Uh, not not in, in the last 20 lifetimes, I guess. Um, maybe since Washington there for a year, maybe. <laughs> but that, that's about it. Uh, so he came and he went forth conquering and to conquer. That's the first seal, all right? The second seal. Let's see, wait a minute, hold on. Uh, the first seal judgment, the rider on the white horse. We the Cold War rise of the Antichrist and the ten nation revised Roman Empire will come forth. We'll read about that a little bit later. Notice though, he carries a bow and goes forth conquering and to conquer, but no arrows are mentioned and he does not fire. The right, rise of the Antichrist to power through a false peace program. This could probably, could probably be considered a reference to his rise to power through diplomacy, false peace, backed by a military threat. Right now, the world is afraid of the United States. Why? Because of our military. 
because we have a massive, powerful military. Whenever our military starts dropping and, and, and our, our, our leaders take away from our military, that's when other countries start kind of looking at us as becoming weak. Well, if, just like I said a minute ago, if we had 50 people and you guys just had you, you would be ready, oh, we'll join up because we want to be a part of the ones that can protect us, not against them. Okay? Um, so if he's coming around with a large military threatening people, it's easier to join than it is to fight. Okay? This initiates the period of the tribulation. It's often referred to as mock millennium. The millennium is when Jesus comes, rules and reigns in true peace for a thousand years. Okay? But he comes as the Antichrist claims to be the virtual savior of mankind and brings in what appears to be world peace. He also implements plans to reform, solve the problems of and control the world's economy and the world's religions. He begins to reunite all nations in a great one world government, economy, and religion. The Antichrist is going to step up and he's going to say, look, I got an idea. How about we all come together as one? Instead of being, you're different, you're different, you're different, you're different. It's just, we're all one. We're just a human race. We're just, all religions, uh, uh, I think it was Nero uh, or Constantine, <coughs> maybe Constantine, uh, the Emperor Constantine brought all religions under Christianity. And he's like, look, I know you guys, you believe in the rock as your God. But I'll give you 500 pieces of gold when you call yourself a Christian, okay? What would you do, God? If I give you 500 pieces of gold, what would you do? Hey, I'm a Christian. <laughs> 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 the, the, that rocks my God, but I'm a Christian. Yeah. And, and, but that's what the, the Antichrist does. Is He's, he's like, look, I, 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 I can bring our economy up. I can make the... the whatever monetary, whether it be the dollar, the euro, or, or the peso, or whatever it is, I can bring it up and it'd be the most powerful piece of money. You got one dollar, guess what? That one dollar is like a million dollars five years ago. Awesome. I want to be a part of that. You know, I want to be able to go out with one dollar in hand and clear out Walmart. <laughs> Let's go. Well, that's what he's going to, he's going to say. That's what he's going to give up front. But with that always comes something behind it doesn't it? always comes the payment the price all right now verse three and when he had opened the second seal i heard the second beast say come and see all right john is still watching this he's, he's seeing this hey, could you imagine him seeing all of this happening and it's in our future not counting his future it's in our future so he's seeing this stuff and happening he's like how could people fall for this? How could people be so naive? Well, let's look at the world today. Of how naive people can be to follow leaders that say, hey, uh, follow me and I'll take care of you. We'll just leave that alone. Think of Hitler. How he took over Germany. And, and, and you know, and the great powerful things that he did just by being a good, fluent, sharp-tongued speaker. Very prolific. In, 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 I don't think that's the right word. But anyway, uh, really being able to sweet talk people. Verse 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So, we see the white horse means peace, or false peace. The red horse, what does the red horse mean? It's, well, kind of. Death comes a little bit later. First, you have war. Red means blood or bloodshed. Uh, so, you have, red means war. So, First he comes as false peace, no war. You guys follow me, I'll take care of everything. Now that you guys are mine and I've got you under control and I've got all your uh, weapons and you're doing everything, now I'm going to take over whether you like it or not. The power was given to him just like the power was given to Hitler at that one time to go in and then just start wiping countries out. 
But this is going to be on a worldwide scale, not just on a uh, Eastern Europe scale. This is going to be on a worldwide scale. All right. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and they that should, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right. The rider on the red horse means the outbreak of hot or bloodshed or war. Now this very well could be a reference to the Gog and Magog uh, war that we will talk about. <clears throat> the Gog and Magog. Now, <clears throat> Gog and Magog is the war where Russia comes down and the Arab alliance gathers together with Russia. And they decide they are coming after Israel. You all realize Israel is sitting on one of the largest oil fields in the world. And they won't touch it. They won't, they won't pipe it yet. They want the Arabs to burn all theirs up. And, and they're going to sit on theirs so they can be taken care of. That's one reason why God gave Israel all that land. Uh, where all these Arabs and everybody's at, that's Israel's land. That was given to Israel by God. Uh, so it, all of that, uh, uh, the, uh, Iran, Iraq, and all them, the Arab Emirates, that's all Israel's. So Israel is actually sitting on the largest oil field compared to all those others. If you, you think about it, Israel's this little bitty thing about that big right there on the map. And then you got Iran, Iraq, and Turkey, and, 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 Pal and all these others around. And they're sitting on the largest one compared to the rest of them. So now Russia decides, hey, look, guys, y'all been trying for years and years and years to destroy Israel. If you join me, we'll go do it. So, and, and uh, Gog and Magog. Gog is, is an old name uh, for Russia or Rosh. If you look it up, Rosh. Russia changed their name from uh, Russia, uh, from Rosh to Russia back in the 1700s, I think it was, 1600s. Um, but it, the, it represents Gog and Magog. Russia is Gog and Magog. Uh, the area of Turkey, uh, Iran, Iraq. And all of those kind of gathered together to come after Israel. And just as all the devil's promises are lies, the Antichrist steps up and says, hold on. As he's coming through and he's wiping out these countries, he sees them coming after Israel and he says, hold on. Stop. Russia and all of them still coming out. So the Antichrist steps in and that's where they have a battle. And then he says, look, you can't beat me. I've got the world's greatest army. And y'all are just these five or six countries come together. And it will stop. You, they will stop. But just as the devil's promises are lies, even so his promise of world peace leads to the greatest world war in human history. There's going to be a battle there that this world has never seen until the battle of Armageddon. Um, it's going to be one of the worst, wildest, most bloodshed battles up to this point. Uh, the battle of Gog and Magog. And, and that's when that's when the Antichrist comes in, swoops in to save Israel. All right, but I'm getting way ahead of myself. All right, verse uh, verse five. There. And when he had opened the third seal, who opened the third seal? Jesus did. Remember, he's he's the one that's opening the scroll, rolling it out, popping the seal, and, and as he's reading it, it's coming forth here on the earth. Okay. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. All right? What does the black horse represent? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Death. Death. Pestilence. Uh, what happens when you have a great war? A huge war? Thousands and thousands of, of men, <clears throat> women, and children dead. What happens? Disease. Disease. Pestilence. Bugs. Uh, start, start coming. Um, so that's what this black horse represents. The ride on the black horse, it, it represents death. And, and, and when you have that much death, and you have that much disease, and you have that much pestilence, what usually happens to the ground? Uh, let's say, let's say we're, uh, how many people do you think we could put in, in this property area right here, that dead bodies. 5,000? 
If you stack them. Uh. It's disgusting, but think. Okay, so what do you do? You bury them. You burn them. Unfortunately, in, in uh, world wars, there were massive bodies, mass graves, uh, where they were buried, and it got so bad that they literally had to start burning the bodies because they were running out of places to bury them. So, but the thing is, if, you have, if you're burning all of this, what else is burning them? How does that, that, that affect the ground when you do this? How does that affect the water, the, the creek here? Uh, how does that affect the, the, the animals, the, 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 the bugs, the, 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 the mosquitoes and, and lice? And, yeah, you could burn them, but it, it starts affecting the ground. It starts affecting, uh, like I said, the waterway, that, which then now affects the, uh, the crops. Because we're, we're destroying all this land because of all these bodies and all this death that's going on because when you have war they don't just pick and choose okay we're going to pull you all out in the street and the only place we're going to destroy you is in the street and we'll shoot you there and then we'll bury you in the street that's not what they do what they what they do in, in hiroshima come on school get right they dropped the atomic bomb the atomic bomb destroyed everything in its path for how many miles it's believed that the, during this there will be a nuclear fallout there is going to be a nuclear war so if there's a, an atomic bomb that can destroy, I forget how many uh, thousands of miles it destroyed, what would an atomic bomb do that is more powerful than, than a hundred, of, uh, I mean uh, a nuclear bomb do that is more powerful than a hundred atomic bombs? What's that? Russia's got this really, like, it's like 200 times more ever than uh, the little boy mm -hmm. dropped on Hiroshima. Russia's got it now? Yeah. Yeah. Say, I mean, think about it. It's been like since the 60s or 70s. Wow. So think about it. If they were to drop just one of those on in, right in the dead center of the United States, and I'm sure they've got more than one. Oh, gosh. And just think if they, just, they dropped that in, 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 in just right down the middle of the United States, what would happen? Cut us right in half. But what would that do to our land? Destroy it. The, the, the atomic bomb destroyed the land there for, uh, what was it, 80 years, 100 years? Well, it wasn't 100 years, because that was in the, what was that, in the 40s? Mm -hmm. uh, what was it, 50 years, 20 years that they couldn't use the land? Yeah. Just now starting to grow back? You destroy something like, you destroy your land like that, you, have, you can't build crops. So if you don't have crops, if you don't have food growing, what do you have? Famine. Famine. Yeah, I did all that to get to famine. <laughs> The, this, this black horse is an outbreak of famine. It's an outbreak of death. Uh, the language of this passage indicates that only one-eighth of the world's food supply will remain. Think of Ethiopia right now. People starving in Ethiopia and starving in Africa. Well, that's just a couple of countries. All right? But think of one-eighth of all the food in the world today gone, destroyed. Think about all the, uh, the, the fields out, out, in the, uh, out west, all the corn fields and the, and the, the wheat fields and, and all of that gone. Uh, let's say from uh, Indiana west destroyed. And now the east coast has got to feed the whole U.S. Well, it's going to be less than that. And let's say the south has to feed the whole U.S. I mean, we'll have it all. No. Okay, uh, the horror of starvation inevitably, inevitably follows war, especially where the war takes place, where the battle takes place. Even now, much of the world stands on the verge of starvation. And just think of our food drives that we have here in the U.S. just to feed our own people, much less the world. Okay. Right there it says in verse 6, And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now a measure of wheat is about a quart, a, a quart of wheat. Okay? So let's just, let's just take this as a, as a quart jar. Alright? It costs us a penny. 
You know how much a penny is or a denarius was in this time? That was a day's wage for that right there. And that's got to feed your family. So let's just say you, you make minimum wage, was it seven dollars an hour, and you work ten hours a day at seventy bucks for that much wheat. How much can I feed my family on that? How much because government's gonna take over half of that. <laughs> They're gonna take over half of my so now uh, let's say I work five days a week. What's five times seventy? Come on, kids. Very good. Thirty-five. All right. Five times seven is three hundred fifty dollars. Take half of that. What's that? One seventy-five. So one hundred seventy-five dollars lasts me all week. Seventy dollars is for me to buy that of wheat. So how much of wheat? How much of this wheat? Anybody ever took wheat and actually grind it down and cook with it? Let's just think of it this way. That's one loaf of bread. So one loaf of bread for 70 bucks, and I only have about $175. So I can buy three loaves of bread. What am I going to put on? Jam sandwich? <laughs> Y'all know what jam sandwich is, don't you? Jam, or you just jam two pieces of bread together and eat it. <laughs> That's about it. So I mean, think about it. And, and then it, it, you get three measures of barley for a penny. Or, or for a day's wage, uh, and what is barley made for or used for? Well, you can make bread out of it, I think. But barley is actually made for uh, uh, like beer. All right, you drink beer, uh, and it's not, and the beer is not for uh, consumption of for the alcohol in it. It's for because it is purified. That's the reason. In the uh, uh, Western Europe, they drink a, a beer or ale. Uh, even the kids drank it because the water was no good. Think about it. Our water is terrible because of the fallout of the nuclear war. But you can take the water and you can boil it and you can make this this uh, this beer, this barley, and it and it fills you up. But it takes three quarts of barley for a day's wage for a drink for just to fill that up right there. Because you're not going to get much. Uh, anybody here ever made made Moonshine? <laughs> okay, you don't have to answer that. Uh, <laughs> but it, it takes a whole lot more than, than what you get out of it. Let's put it that way. You just go buy coffee. <laughs> you just go buy coffee? <laughs> That's going to be three weeks wage right there. So you ain't going to have any coffee. <laughs> but it, it's, it, it's not because the alcohol is... I'm not trying to go down that road with it. It's because of the purification of the water, uh, the, way, the way it's made. And then it also... It helps you with your, uh, your bowels and, and the such in your body. But what he's trying to get across here is that there's going to be famine in the land. Donna, you're not going to have anything to eat. You're not going to have anything to eat. You're not going to have anything to eat. Gerald's the only one that's going to have anything to eat. And you've got to feed everybody. And you've got a quart of wheat. That's it. A quart jar of wheat. And you've got to feed the four of them. And everybody back here, sorry. Y'all just got to start that's how bad it's going to be for a day's wage. For what it took you to make all day, you've got enough just to feed y'all for the week. That's it. You guys, uh, Donna, you better, better get them kids to work so I'm trying. Child, child work, and it's going to happen. But what he's trying to put here is that it's going to get so bad that for a penny, a day's wage, is all you're going to get is a penny. And you can buy a, a, a little bit of wheat or a, a loaf of bread. Is all you're going to be able to buy. Okay. All right. And then let's go and get into verse 7. Oh, wait a minute. It says, uh, For a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Uh, what does the oil and wine do? And I'm not talking about wine to drink with your meal, uh, you know, or, wine, or a wine that drinks uh, bootleg or whatever. I, I, I'm not talking about that. What is wine used for? Or what is used for in, like in the Old Testament days? Or even oil. What was oil used for? Well, it was for cooking, yes. For lamps. The lamps. Uh, for the lamps, yeah. But see, we don't have enough money for oil for the lamps. We're just going to have to, when it gets dark, we're done. Uh, because we've got to save our oil for the cooking of our wheat. But it was uh, also... Dip the bread in. Well, you, if you were able to make some bread, then you'd be able to dip a little bit, give it a little bit more flavor, yeah. But a rich man would have that much oil. 
The oil was used for medicine. Wine was used for medicine. Uh, have you ever heard them that you were anointed with oil? <clears throat> okay. The reason that people were anointed with oil or the oil was poured on, uh, let's, let's go back to the uh, 23rd Psalm. Thou anointest my head with oil. Why did the shepherd anoint the sheep with oil? In case they had any little bugs up here. See, the, the lice and the, and the little bugs that would get on the, the, the sheep couldn't, couldn't stay because they, he'd pour oil in. He'd rub it in real good. The oil was also used if they had a cut. It would clean the cut. They'd take a little bit of that wine and that would, that would uh, 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 not purify it, but that would uh, ant like an antiseptic. And it would wash out the bugs and the dirt in the cut and then pour oil in it and that would keep the bugs out. So the oil and the wine... Uh, that was that God said, or Jesus said, which is God, but Jesus said, uh, make sure that you don't hurt the oil and wine. There's, there, there's going to be a need, a major need for uh, the, the antiseptic nature of the wine and the, the, for, of the oil itself. Because there's going to be so much pestilence, there's going to be so much lice, so many bugs from all the bodies laying around. People are going to need this oil. They're going to need the wine. Uh, to, to stay alive, to, just to keep the germs away from us. Uh, might as well forget hand sanitizer. <laughs> we ain't going to have none of that. But we'll have a little bit of oil and a little bit of, of wine to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, what did Paul tell Timothy to do? He said, drink a little bit of wine for your stomach. Yeah, you got stomach problems uh, because of the, the, the fallout of the nuclear war, the dust in the air? Well, take a little bit of wine. Uh, and, and drink it, and that will calm your stomach and help things uh, move along as they need to be moved. Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the oil and the wine is for uh, our own um, health reasons, not for luxury of just sitting and drinking a glass of wine with a meal. Okay? All right, now verse 7. And when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And it, I see it is eight o'clock, so we'll just have to stop there. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, we'll have to. We'll have to stop there. Well, then you didn't talk fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> and you all said I was talking too fast. Now. We're just fast forward right now. <laughs> <clears throat> all right, guys. I I'm sorry. I do get. Get to rambling and talking, and I want, I want you all to just like uh, J. Vernon McGee said, uh, this is like a, a, a TV show that John is watching. It's kind of like the way I want you all. I want you all to see, picture in your mind um, what was going on and how how everything's going on uh, or will go on in the future. What's up? Descriptions of yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have a TV behind us for us to see, so I got to give the descriptions for you to be able to see. Okay, um, but before we go, a minute or two. Any questions on what we've already done? Oh. Is the stuff with the seals going to happen before or after we go up into heaven? Go up on the cloud. Uh, the rapture? You talking? You talking about the rapture? The, the rapture has already taken place. Okay, when, 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 we're not here for we'll be a part of this. Yeah, we, we will not be. If, if you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ right now, we will not be a part of this. Oh, I'm glad you asked that. There's, there are people, there are religions that teach amillennialism that all of this that we are reading is in our history. It's already happened. And that we are trying to get good enough to where Jesus will be happy with us till we come back, until he comes back and takes and he sets up his millennial rank. That that uh, the seals and the, the bowls and the trumpets uh, judgments has already happened. Uh, that's called amillennialism. That that that, that, uh, that we're living through this, and a lot of this stuff is already in the past. No, the Bible makes it clear that we, the church, will go up before uh, the the great tribulation. Right? Uh, remember where we talked about John was called up into heaven that's what I believe that the, the church will go into heaven uh, and all of this will be taking place because, uh, because the, the, 
the Holy Spirit uh, is not there. Uh, oh, man! I forgot to talk. Y'all got that. Go on, there you go. What's that? No, I did, I did not. <laughs> and I want to talk about Matthew chapter 25. Matthew write, chapter... Write your down while you're writing. Okay, let me write that down too. We're going to have to start at 6.30 so we can get everything in that we need to get in. Oh, my goodness. We took a long time for our prayer stuff. We, well, we did, but we, we need that. We need that. We, yeah. we need the prayer request. We need that. We need to start at 6.30 <laughs> and then at 7 we can do this. Anyway, guys, help me remember that i got to talk about Matthew chapter 25 in this here, okay? Uh, because that, that Jesus told us about uh, uh, there will be wars and rumors of wars. Jesus explained all of that about the four horsemen right here in Matthew 25. So if you want to go read it, read up on it, you can and be ready for it next week. But but we, we got to talk about that next week too, okay? Oh my goodness. <laughs> all right. Sorry. Yeah. I, mean, I wanted to I wanted to talk about. Anyway, that, we're not quite finished with the four horsemen, so it'll still tie everything in. All right, All right let's go to the Lord's Word of Prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you, Lord. Thank you for this book. Thank you for your Word. Thank you for just the book of Revelation that, that we can get excited about, that we can talk about, that we can learn about the things that are going to happen and know that we're not going to be a part of it, that we're not going to be here, that we're not going to have to suffer through this. But... Unfortunately, Lord, there will be people that are that are alive during our time that may go through this because they think that that, that they don't need Jesus, that they don't need to get saved, that, well, they'll wait until the day they die to get saved. Father, just help us. Help us to just be that, that shining light. Help us to be the ones to just keep pushing and keep telling people that they need to get saved. They need to come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Father, I thank you for the excitement that you put into us, Lord. I know I get uh, get excited, get going too fast, Lord. And, and Lord, please forgive me for that. But Lord, I, I do hope and pray that we we can walk away tonight saying it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Father, I ask that you bless your people the rest of this week. Uh, just uh, give them an extra special blessing as they go out, uh, that they know that they are loved by you. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank <laughs> you.